years had come and gone since the so-called end times had been thwarted, and still many lands bore the scars of the power unleashed by the gods of chaos and the Skaven. <clears throat> Between the actions of the races of order in Bretonia and the inherently treacherous nature of the Skaven and their dark powers, the forces of chaos were defeated, and the demonic energies have ebbed away. In its wake were left many destroyed lands, including those of Tilea, Estalia, and the border princes. In the time since, new powers have come to these areas, seeking to pick the bones of the dead civilizations and uncover the great powers left behind by Chaos and the Skaven. So we begin our tale with three of these powers, coming together at an ancient mystical site in what was northern Tilea. Hungry for plunder, these forces did not realize that the coming of Chaos changed not only the lands of Tilea, but the winds of magic that flowed through them. And this magic did not wish to be taken by the unworthy, and it would fight to defend itself. So, welcome to the first battle report of the new campaign. Uh, it is going to be a Triumph and Treachery game, but we do have something a little special going on. Uh, in the center, you can see the Sorceress Portal that was made for us by Black Tower Terrain. Um, it's awesome looking, and it's going to be the centerpiece of this battle. In addition to the normal victory points that are earned by killing and destroying, um, at the end of each game turn, each unit within six inches of that portal will earn the controlling player 100 victory points. Um, furthermore, as soon as those victory points are doled out, the Sorceress Portal will spit out a single random spell from the end time spell selection magic deck that will affect all of the units within six inches. So, um, chance for a lot of crazy magic going on, um, and a lot of points to be there if you can get in good and tight uh, next to that Sorceress Portal. So, uh, beyond that, we are using all of our rules for the current campaign, including looting of various terrain features, which does happen in the game, and I'll explain it as we get there. Uh, but today's Triumph and Treachery is going to be Skip's Dark Elves, Michael's Dwarves, and my Lizardmen hashing it out for control over this Sorceress Portal. So, let's go ahead and get into deployment. So this is after everything goes down. So you see the dwarves have a unit of 10 uh, rangers that have scouted into this mysterious forest. Turns out this forest is a uh, just a normal wood, so nothing he really needs to worry about. Then in his actual deployment area, on the left you see he has a unit of, looks like, 20 iron breakers with full command. He also has his Thane BSB and uh, his... Runesmith, both of which are named characters, which do have import in this game. Uh, next to that is a unit of, looks like 20, I think there's six times, 24 uh, dwarf warriors with great weapons and a gyrocopter. So we then go into the Dark Elves deployment. He has a line of harpies up front. Uh, that fountain there we're actually just treating as mysterious water. Uh, the forest in the back, he drops his unit of Blackguard with his level 2 Sorceress, uh, 2 Dark Magic, again a named character, and uh, that's actually a poison forest, so he lost some guys from Dangerous Terrain for deploying there. Then he's got a brick of what looks like 20 witches with a his Death Hag BSB. Then up here, already vanguarded, he has his unit of uh, Dark Riders that are going for the portal very early on. Then my forces, you see I have my uh, Ripper Dactyls vanguarded up. I have my 16-man Saurus block with Gorokoth, my Scarvet, as well as Mapikaju, the Skink Priest, level 2 Lore of Heavens, and Kubanai, who is my Skink Chief BSB. I have a Salamander next to them and a Bastilodon next to that. Then you can see I have a uh, unit of Skink Skirmishers in the building, so I can go ahead and loot that first turn. And a second Skink Skirmishers unit in front of the building going to go square off against those uh, Dwarf Rangers in the forest. Alright, so Dwarves get to go first in turn one, 
and uh, he's moving the gyrocopter very aggressively, wants to eliminate the harpies. He really notices he's limited in movement, so he wants to target the things that can move faster. So definitely think that's smart. Other than that, he just makes sure that his two big bricks are outside of the six inches of the portal. Really doesn't want to get blasted with any nasty end time spells before he's ready. Um, and then over here, he attempts to loot the forest and rolls a one, which results in traps. And he ends up taking two strength five hits with armor piercing, and I think loses one ranger out of that for for the traps. So, uh, not the best uh, looting roll f to start the campaign on, that's for certain. So, in the shooting phase, he names the Dark Elves his enemies, and the gyrocopter roasts three out of the five harpies, but miraculously enough, the harpies succeed their leadership role and don't panic. So then uh, it goes into my Lizardman's turn one. Uh, I charge his Dark Riders with my Ripperdactyls. He wisely chooses to flee and ends up right there blocking up his Witch Elves. And after the failed charge is resolved, this is where the Rippers end up. And that does put the Rippers within six inches of the portal because we are counting the entire uh, flocked base that the portal is counting on for the purposes of this uh campaign so I'm just inside that so they're going to get blasted unless they're killed during the Dark Elves turn so then as you see here everything else I've got comes up uh, pretty aggressively <coughs> the boulder there we're treating as impassable terrain so I'm using it to kind of shield the side of my uh, Saurus in the building the skinks hit a uh, treasure chest and I find 4d6 gold there and uh, netted 18 gold pieces but I have to get a named character into that unit before it gets permanently added to my army or it could be lost if that unit's destroyed so I'm moving Mapikaju back so that he can join up with them and get that gold. Then during my magic phase, I decide that I don't really want the dwarves to be able to just sit there while the Dark Elves and I go at each other. So I drop a Comet of Cassandora where that blue die is right in between his two units. So I figure he's either going to have to uh, get moving or get blown up, which either way, I'm pretty cool with that. Uh, the benefit with this is that with the way the turns go in Triumph and Treachery, you get a lot more chances to add dice or trigger the the comet um, so that's pretty strong there then we go into the dark elves turn and he manages to rally his dark riders and moves them back up so that they're still trying to draw out my ripperdactyls and then he sends his uh, harpies into the mysterious water which is just normal water uh, in an attempt to loot that he does take the looting action and finds more traps and the traps kill one of the two harpies. Again, the harpies get lucky and do not break. Then during magic phase... Oh, and the uh, other dark elves in the back forest looted it for four gold pieces. Um, but up here, uh, the during magic phase, he blasts some dark magic spell at my uh, salamander. And puts one wound on the salamander and kills three of the four handlers, which was certainly not what I wanted to have happen. And then in shooting phase, the Dark Riders have crossbows, so they open up on my Ripperdactyls and manage to inflict one wound on a Ripperdactyl. And then at the end of turn one, my Ripperdactyls are the only unit within six, so I gain 100 extra victory points, and they have the Lore of Nehekara spell cast on them, and we decided beforehand that if there were any specifics of who could be targeted, we would ignore them for the... Uh, purposes of the scenario. So the Ripper Dactyls got plus one to weapon skill, initiative, and strength until the end of turn two is how we're ruling it. So pretty awesome. So, uh, oh, and we had forgotten because of the multiple turns uh, to trigger the comet. So we went ahead and triggered that. Uh, it did go off and as you can see, blew up a great number of dwarves. Uh, I think five out of the one unit and four out of the other. So nine dwarves die from one comet. Uh, I'm pretty happy with that. So Dark Elves start out turn two. Uh, the Riders stay where they are, but the Witch Elves start moving up. They didn't really have a... 
They might even have tried to charge the dwarves, but it was something ridiculous. They needed like 11. But they didn't get it and move up just a little bit. And then poor Skip comes out of the poison forest back here and kills off five of the executioners from dangerous terrain um, from the poison forest. So um, we were making jokes about keeping a tally to see by the end of this campaign if Skip would lose more people to dangerous terrain or to the enemy. Um, at this point, dangerous terrain is winning. <laughs> yep, and here's the rest of the movement. He does decide to get the uh, Dark Riders close enough to the portal, so he'll get those points. Nice thing is they are still within the front arc of my Rippers, so I'm planning on attacking them and uh, hopefully getting rid of them next turn. And then because he figures he might as well, he parks the Harpy right in front of the portal because that'll be 200 XP and or 200 victory points and uh, what else is he going to do with the Harpy? <laughs> And then during magic, uh, Dark Elves choose the Dwarves as their enemy, and uh, they bla doom bolt the, uh, the gyrocopter off the board, which I think is the first unit killed. So first, first true blood goes to the Dark Elves. But unfortunately, to pull that spell off, he miscast, dropped a small template on his head, did one wound to himself, and killed two more of... The executioner. So he's only there with uh, his character. What's what is her name? Uh, Branwyn Ever or no? Sorry, Alyssa Nightblade and Champion and like three more dudes out of that executioner's unit. It's pretty embarrassing. So dwarves get uh, second place in turn two. Uh, decide basically to reform and back up. They don't want any of that magic coming down on them. And they're a little nervous of the witch elves coming on. Uh, he's still closely packed enough where if I wanted to drop another comet, um, it's still pretty good. So I'm not super worried about this. And that was all the dwarves did. So we go into Lizardmen part of turn two, and I managed to succeed the charge of the Ripperdactyls into the horses. Uh, I half expected him to uh, fail this one, or to, to flee on this one. Uh, he didn't, so we're going to fight it. Uh, the one thing I don't realize here at this point is, because I'm frenzied, I've got to overrun it. If I kill them, I am going to clip the witches and have to go into their front, um, and I just, I didn't pay enough attention to that. Um, everything else, uh, as you can see, I've run my skinks inside. They are going to end up looting the forest this turn, and I gain another, uh, five gold with them. And then I'm running the salamander up because I, he gave me a perfect line down his whole side there to burn him if I can get a good roll. And I'm essentially using the Bastilodon to block for it f so those rangers don't throw their freaking axes at me. Um... And over here, <coughs> Mapikaju joins the skinks who come out of the building, and I officially have the first gold permanently in my unit uh, at 18 gold pieces at this point. Just as a reminder to those who have not been paying attention to the, the rule setup we've been talking about on the Warhammer YouTuber site, those gold pieces can be spent on a point-for-point -point basis to add higher-powered magic items to my possible army build lists. So, very exciting. Um... Over here, I end up, I do get the fire basically down the line. Uh, I don't do a whole heck of a lot of wounds. So uh, I think I killed two of the, the Iron Breakers and a couple of great weapon guys, but uh, they're not going to panic or anything. But wounds is wounds. And then during combat, I eat the Dark Riders alive, get points for them, and I overrun just enough to clip the front of the Witches, which basically is going to serve my Ripperdactyls up on a platter to them. Um, cool thing about fighting the, the Dark Riders, though, is I had the bonus from the spell from the portal last turn for initiative, and I used one of the treachery cards to give another bonus to initiative, so I was actually faster than them, and they didn't get rerolls on Always Strike First. So, end of turn two, uh, the Dark Elves are the only ones to get the points, but then the spell goes off, and it is the Slanesh spell, which drops the Harpy's leadership by two and ends up giving control of it to the Dwarves now. So the Dwarves have control of a single Harpy with, with leadership three. This is a Remains in Play spell, and it'll stick there until, during subsequent turns, the Harpy can succeed his leadership three check and break control. And... 
<coughs> then you see, uh, start of turn three, the harpy staying near the, the portal turns around to wave high at its new allies, as the dwarves did get to go first in turn three as well. Realizing that it is not overly smart to give a perfect line of fire to a salamander, the dwarves finally start to break and move forward. The iron breakers are going to come and deal with what I'm putting pressure on on this side, and the great weapon wielders look like they're turning to face the witch elves. And then during movement, the uh, rangers about face, and they're going to throw some hand axes at my skinks who are hiding behind them. Then over here, the shooting phase starts with the champion of the Ironbreakers unit hucking his grenade out, trying to hit my salamander. It drifts right back onto his head, but they've got such insane armor, uh, it doesn't hurt them. And the thrown axes look like it kills three of my skinks, but uh, cold-blooded is amazing, and they're not going anywhere. And just to make sure that his murdering during... Uh, oh, and this now we go into Dark Elves' turn. Uh, the only thing the Dark Elves really had to do, they moved their other unit in the back there up a little bit, and then go into combat to brutalize me. And just to make sure that it was going down bad, he threw a treachery card that made me have to reroll any successful armor saves. So yeah, I didn't even get to swing. The Witch Elves just absolutely tore apart the Rippers. And they reform at this point to this point or maybe they moved a little i don't even recall um either way at this point um it actually looks like the dark elves are winning at this point because he's captured more points than anybody uh i'm in a close second because of the points i got from the portal in the center uh turn one um and the dwarves are in third at this point um and this is what two-thirds of the way through turn two so my turn, I decide to declare the dwarves as my enemies during movement and attempt a long bomb charge with the Bastilladon and end up catching the uh, Iron Breakers right in the face, which is cool. They're only strength four. Uh, they do have a Rune Priest in there, but that's still like a four-up armor save for me. And I want to get in there and kill his characters, get those points, um, and just hold that unit up. So very happy with that. Uh, my skinks run around his dwarves again. Um, the idea here is they've got five gold pieces that I need to get out and get to a character. So I'm just kind of running around and I'm basically hoping to turn and, and get the heck out of that forest next turn and get them over to Mapikaju or Kubo and I and let those guys pick up the gold. And then here I decide to move up both the salamander and my big unit of skinks within six of the portal. Uh, I'm going to be using my shooting phase to try and kill the Harpy so the Dwarves don't get extra points uh, for the Harpy this turn. So we'll see if that ends up working out for me. Then in the back, these Skinks and Mopikaju are basically coming up as, as a reserve. I don't really know where they're going to be needed yet, so I don't want to overcommit them. Then during Magic Phase, I miscast and drop a Comet right on that blue die in the center there. Luckily, it was a miscast 7, and I only wounded the guys directly around Mopikaju and lost a couple of skinks, so uh, not a huge problem there. And here you see the wounds uh, done to that group uh, as it is. It might have been a... Actually, I think I killed two. It might have been a small template. That that actually makes more sense because it looks like Mopikaju has a wound on him. Uh, that might be right. I, I don't know. Um, sorry to, to drop the ball on that one. Then... Uh, in, com in shooting, I do kill the, the Harpy. I just didn't take a picture of it. Uh, during close combat, I end up putting a wound on his BSB with the Strength 10 tail attack from the Bastilladon. I also kill two other of the Iron Breakers with Thunder Stomps, and he puts one wound on me. So I win, but he's stubborn and not going anywhere. So end of turn three, I get 200 points for being... In the middle there, uh, with the Salamander and the Skinks, but then the spell from the Lore of Death goes off, so you see the two portals where they are, where they end up, uh, They any unit they go over has to make a leadership check minus three or take wounds, um, luckily Cold-Blooded there saves my butt and I don't take any. Um, so we go into turn four and I get first turn. So I decide I don't want to be hanging around these portals running all over the place. So I swift reform with 
the skinks and start moving them this way. I start moving the, uh, or no, sorry, I s move the skinks around. I s swift reform with the saurus and start moving them this way. I just want to get away from those crazy portals flying around all over the place. Um, and I don't know what I'm looking at here. Uh, I think maybe the maybe the the comet went off and killed some some witch elves. That makes sense. Either that, or I caught them with the 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 flame. Uh, one of the other two. I'll I'll find out when I go to the next picture if I see the comet die still down. After that, I we go into combat. Uh, I did in magic get ice shard blizzard off these guys, so they're hitting a little less. They still managed to squeak one wound in. I do n I fail to wound his BSB with the tail and only kill one of the iron breakers, so I lose. But uh, my BSB is right nearby, and cold blooded with a reroll is awesome. So it is dwarf's part of the turn. Um, the great weapon guys just back away a little bit. Um, he doesn't want to get hit by the portal, but to be honest, with, with what both the Dark Elves and, and the Lizard Men have on the table, I'm not entirely sure Michael knows what to do with those Great Weapon guys. There's not really a whole lot that they're good against here, uh, except maybe the, the Bastilladon, and they can't get to him from where they're at. So he's just been kind of not able to do a lot with them. Uh, and of course, he Swift Reforms here and is going to be throwing some more axes at my Skinks who are trying to get away. Then we go into combat here. Uh, I do manage to kill his BSB at this point. They put another wound on the Bastilladon. I think I kill one more Ironbreaker. Um, I think I win. It was close. It's like one point one way or the other, but nobody's going to break at this point. And this is actually the picture I was waiting for. <coughs> Apparently that was not the comment going off. I did hit the... Uh, Witch Elves with Fire from a long range. But yeah, it, that counter, that Comet's up to like three tokens at this point, because it's getting a token on everybody's magic phase. Um, and it's it's scary right there. But the Dark Elves don't really have anything else to do. The Witch Elves try to charge the Dwarves again and fail and move forward an inch. And uh, the... Yeah, and here the Wizard, uh, Alyssa, and her... Uh, four remaining executioner or blackguard are uh, making their way around to to cause some flank trouble but they're all going to have to deal with that comet that could go off any second and speaking of any second start of the magic phase the comet goes off evaporates the uh blackguard and Alyssa and kills four or five witch elves and a back rank of the dwarves so it did just a ridiculous amount of damage and then end of turn four comes i get another 200 points because my saurus and the salamander were still near it and then the portal spits out two of the zinch spell which runs over uh basically my big unit twice and on four ups they take a wound with no armor save so i've got like one rank plus one left the salamander uh has did not take a wounds and a couple more of the skinks died so it's bad news so i get to go next in turn five <coughs> and decide again i'm getting the hell out of dodge right now i'm caught between so many of these vortexes because they keep coming at me um i just i need to scatter so i swift reform and move south again Mabikaju runs up and joins the other skink unit so that I can collect that five gold. So I'm up to 23 gold for the turn. And uh, that's pretty much what we're dealing with here. Uh, then during magic phase, I miscast again and drop another comet basically right where I had put it before. Again, it was a <coughs> miscast five, six, seven, something like that. I, it did very little. Uh, wounded a couple of guys. So I'm losing a couple skinks, but I'm still putting comets down right where they need to be to prevent my opponents from getting too close to the portal and, and scoring those easy points. Um, so we go into combat because I got no shooting. Uh, and finally, the Bastilladon kills his general and runs. the unit breaks and is run down now that they have no BSB. So, uh, yeah, that's scary because 
now with both Forrick, uh, which is his BSB, and uh, Gris Stonebeard having died in combat, that is two potential character death rolls he has to make at the end of the game. <coughs> so we then go into, I think this is Dark Elf turn. They try again to charge the dwarves and fail for his third consecutive try, I think. Um, come forward very, very little, and basically have put themselves into auto range, just about auto range of the comet when it eventually does come down. And then on the Dark Elf magic phase, the comet does come down and wrecks Dwarf Face. Uh, there's only three great weapon dwarves left there. Uh, it did nothing to the witches. Um, I just rolled like crap. So Dwarf turn five goes... Uh, and he charges into the flank of my skinks with my priest in there. And that's very bad. Because um, even with that, he's, the likelihood of him killing them is pretty high. Um, and this is end of turn five. You can see that the dwarf rangers did kill my skinks, but they fled over the dangerous terrain, or the impassable terrain, and my, uh, my saurus and escaped there. And they were, and his dwarves were stopped. Then the the spell goes off for the end of the turn, and I've got two units in it, so two more hundred points for me. <coughs> and it was the life spell, so big templates of life come down, restore a bunch, basically almost all of the skinks out of that one unit, restore the uh, um the the half of the saurus left, and restored everything out of the salamander. So. That was just icing on the cake for the lizard men at that point. So we go into turn six. The three remaining uh, great sword guys, which had reformed last turn, charge into the flank of my Bastilladon. And then his rangers reform and come up to throw some axes at my uh, salamander there. And after the axes are thrown, it looks like one salamander handler dies, and that's it. So we go into close combat, and I play a treachery card to declare an alliance between myself and the dwarves, which means we can't fight this turn, so we have to disengage. So, because I mean, I knew those great weapon guys were probably going to get the Bastilladon. It was really my only my only chance to not give up those points. Um, so I had to. So then we go into Dark Elf turn. Uh, the witches attempt to charge. I don't remember if they attempt to charge the back of the dwarves or my salamanders. <coughs> or salamander. Um, either way, again, they just they didn't succeed. Only benefit here is they do end up within six of the portal, so he'll get some extra points at the end of the turn. Then during my turn, I turn around the Bastilladon to look at the remaining dwarf greatsword guys. Um, I think this might be after shooting because it looks like one of them's dead. I, I huck javelins at him. And then during the magic phase, I use the laser beam from the Engine of the Gods to eradicate the last two. And that's the last action of the game. As the few remaining dwarves and dark elves retreated, the Scarvet known as Gorokoth approached the glowing portal. Its magic was well beyond the scope of his inborn battle knowledge, but he did recognize it as a threat. Slowly he stuck his forward his spear. No, no, no! A shrill voice called from the back. Surprisingly, the massive warrior complied with the high-pitched command and stood back. Pushing forward came the skink priest Mapikachu, known as the Voice of Tanakh. Barely coming up to Gorokoth's waist, another race might have thought it silly for the Saurus to bow to the wishes of the silly-looking small lizard. But such was the way of the lizard men. This is what the great Tanakh has sent us for, Gorokoth. And we have claimed it as commanded. The Saurus smiled at the recognition of having fulfilled his duty. Mapikaju then pulled a small stone from his pouch. Now it is time for Mapikaju to do as he is bid. The skink rattled off a string of magical words and thrust the stone into the portal. The magic within sparked and hissed as it fought against the powers of Lord, that Lord Tenok imbued in the stone. But within seconds, the power of the Slan proved greater and the portal went quiet. Almost instantly, the voice of Lord Tenok sprung from Mapikaju's lips. Excellent, the voice thrummed with power. Our first steps have found proper purchase. 
and the anchor of the great web is restored. Move quickly, for the greed of young races seeks to work against prophecy, and much of the web must be repaired before I join you. Suddenly, flashes of images filled the skink priest's mind as his master told him of their next destination. Without a word, Mapikaju left the site that they had spent the day spilling so much blood for and wandered into the wilderness, with his troops marching silently behind him. So we had a pretty significant victory for the lizard men, and in accordance with the victory tables that we roll at the end, my result was lost treasures, which means I doubled the amount of gold my army claimed at the end of the battle. So I had 23 gold pieces, so at the end I have 46 gold pieces now added to the lizard men army. I did also roll for the potential death of Mapikachu, and he did not die from his wounds. And the Dark Elves were defeated, and on the table, their defeat result was Deserters. So he had to choose one unit that participated in this battle, and he cannot use any models from that unit uh, in the next battle the Dark Elves play, and he chose that the Blackguard deserted. Uh, he also gained four gold pieces to add to his army's total. And in last place were the Dwarves, and their defeat result was the Low Morale Entry, which means the next time the Dwarves fight in a battle, they will be at a minus one to all leadership roles. Um, probably the least offensive thing the Dwarves could have taken. Unfortunately, he was also unable to loot anything, um, so he gets zero gold to add to his army. But fortunately, neither... Forrick, the bearer of the van, or Gris Stonebeard were actually killed uh, due to their falling in battle during this game. So, all in all, I thought this was a great first game to get us in, get everybody playing. Um, I am super surprised at how much gold the lizard man ended up walking out with, but that's awesome. I've got to do some thinking on how and if I'm going to spend that immediately. <coughs> um... Beyond that, it was it was a lot of fun. I think there were definitely some, some errors that were made that could be attributed to sort of learning new armies uh, and learning sort of how to play in this type of scenario. Um, I think we were all definitely surprised at the lack of war machines from the dwarves, but I think that will be rectified next game. Um, but other than that, it was fun. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Hope you got a, a good feeling for where the story is going, and we've got more coming at you in the coming weeks. Uh, I did want to say at the end, thanks to Black Tower Terrain, <coughs> who uh, was the source of every piece of terrain on this table, excepting the one building that started off into my corner that was done by the Terrain Wench. Um, all of the pieces looked great. It was a lot of fun to have them on the board, and uh, thank you for, for your hard work. Uh, anybody who wants to get some pieces of terrain like this for themselves can contact him at blacktowerterrain at gmail.com. Uh, anyway, thank you guys for watching. As always, if you have any comments, please leave them below. And other than that, we'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.